Hello, my name is Stefan Dörkon. I am the director of the Center for the Study of African Economies. In principle, we should be having our annual conference now in Oxford, but of course, for a reason that you all understand, uh, we can't do this at the moment. So therefore we have our hashtag uh, DIY CSAE, uh, we, are, we have our do-it-yourself CSAE conference, and we are grateful for several people to give a little bit of their time to actually give us some contribution. And one of these people is Albert Zerfak. Uh, Albert is the chief economist uh, of the Africa region for the World Bank, and he's joining us uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome, Albert. Thank you so much, Stefan. Okay. And um, so, Albert, uh, if you could give us a little bit of a sense in this particular crisis situation on the continent, what are your views, your thoughts of the likely impact of COVID-19 on African economies? Thank you very much, Stefan, for this question. And, and first of all, let me say, uh, friends, we're, we're living really under unprecedented times. This is, you know, one of its kind. Uh, this is probably the worst crisis I've seen in my lifetime, for sure. And uh, the first message I would really like to, uh, to leave you with here is that it's going to be serious. And African countries should take this crisis extremely seriously. Even if we had a late start on the continent, our uh, analysis and our research is clearly pointing to the fact that you know, the impact of COVID-19 will be extremely important and will be significantly negative on African economies. And this will be the case because of a number of reasons. The first is because unlike 2008, this crisis is of a larger magnitude. Unlike 2008, where the channel of transmission was the financial sector, where African countries were less connected, the main channel of transmission for this crisis is trade, where Africa is actually very, very much connected. It is going to go through commodities that have been driving African economies. It's going to be extremely important through FDI flows and capital flows that may actually decline. So it's gonna be extremely important uh, in terms of impact, economic impact on African countries. In addition, there will be domestic channels of transmission, just like we have learned with Ebola. Because at the end of the day, it's about the sheer factor. When we see countries like China or India or now increasingly African countries on lockdown, um, people are not going to be out there, you know, uh, uh, you know, people are not going to be out there producing and working hard as they usually do. And that will definitely impact economies. So we will have, you know, not only a global, uh, you know, a global contagion phenomenon, uh, through trade and through disruptions of value chains, but would also have domestic transmission mechanism that would slow down on our economies. And Stefan, what is even more important here is that the timing cannot be worse. Timing cannot be worse for Africa because since 2016, where Africa recorded its lower growth performance in two decades, continent has been slowly recovering, sluggishly recovering, and this crisis would clearly put a halt to that slow recovery. And while we're still working on, you know, putting exact numbers on, on the impact, we believe this would certainly, you know, considerably lower growth prospects in Africa. So, you give, of course, a very grim picture and the agency, the ability to respond for countries may be quite limited. However, what do you think countries could still do now to try to mitigate or to reduce the impact uh, of the crisis on their economies? Well, in terms of policy response, uh, Stefan, 
African countries have started to take the right measures because ultimately, um, you know, economics alone will not do it. We need to tackle the health crisis. And although the number of cases in Africa is not extremely large yet, and we pray that it stays low, uh, there's no guarantee that uh, the number will remain low. And even if that number was to stay, to remain low, um, you know, the health, uh, the health uh, crisis is there to manage. So what countries should do and should continue doing is containment. We need to make sure we continue, uh, you know, uh, taking those measures that limit uh, circulation that limit, uh, you know, uh, uh, crowds that make sure people actually stay home, just like we're doing here in, in the U.S. now. Uh, I've been working from home for the past two weeks uh, and, and, you know, with uh, internet connection, uh, it seems to be working. I do know that in African countries, because of limited connectivity, this may not be uh, the most effective way but, but it is important to uh, take all the measures possible for activities to continue without, uh, uh, without, without uh, 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 being uh, in, the, in, in the positions to, uh, to make more, more crowds. So yes, containment is first, and it's been already uh, done by a number of countries. We should continue doing that. The second is, um, you know, uh, making sure we get our health system stronger to, uh, you know, test the uh, potential cases and isolate them and provide, uh, you know, some treatment. Uh, that's the second thing. But the third most important policy response I see, Stefan, is on the fiscal side. One of the things that is going to hit Africa right away is a fiscal crisis due to the collapse in commodities prices. Most African countries have budgeted oil at 55, around 55. If oil prices remain below 30 for a prolonged period, we're speaking of a massive fiscal crisis in Africa. So our countries need to really mobilize all uh, the help they can <clears throat> to, uh, you know, to continue uh, basically uh, spending in areas that are critical, especially human capital, especially health, uh, and, and, and that's certainly something, uh, you know, uh, crucial, and that's where the World Bank is also preparing to help. So you mentioned already the World Bank is preparing to help, you know, what form do you think the World Bank's uh, support <clears throat> Look, um, since the beginning of this crisis uh, at the World Bank, we've been really mobilizing to uh, assist, uh, you know, African countries. And we are currently discussing with most of our client countries in, you know, uh, identifying areas where we can step up our efforts for policy lending, for budget support, to face that fiscal crisis that is looming. Uh, we are also working with different countries for emergency operations in the health sector. And you probably know the World Bank has actually, the board has approved a $14 billion uh, uh, financing package so that we can actually use it to assist African countries. So it's in the area of health, you know, health, um, emergency health uh, uh, projects but also uh, scaling up our development policy lending, our budget support to allow African countries to, uh, uh, to face the fiscal crisis that is uh, looming. This is, of course, these are, of course, grim times. And I'm sure that many people who listen to this and watch this are actually researchers that normally work on problems, but maybe not with that same kind of urgency. If researchers would like to do something useful now, what do you think on Africa that they could actually be most useful uh, in help to thinking about what a recovery could take or what the responses could do? So any suggestions of how researchers could respond? That's an excellent question, uh, Stefan. And as you can imagine, 
we are all busy at the World Bank trying to quantify the impact of COVID on uh, African futures growth. And I can tell you, uh, there is no uh, single uh, magic bullet. Uh, there's no single model that can actually allow you to uh, really pinpoint exactly what you're doing, what we can, what this impact is going to be. So we are all uh, working across uh, the World Bank group, different chief economists in different regions. We are all discussing and exchanging notes. So one area where research is still useful is, you know, what kind of macro model would actually be the most suited to really quantify this kind of health impact on, on, on short, but also medium to long-term growth in a way that is uh, easier. That's, that's actually um, more convincing, let, let me put it that way. Um, and I'm working with Cesar and other colleagues on uh, you know, using a, a CGE framework uh, to capture not only the short term, but also the medium term uh, impact of uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, you know, virus on, the, uh, on, on, on growth prospects in Africa. But, but there are many other uh, options. Our country economists are using the MF mode uh, you know, to capture, you know, at the country level, the uh, uh, the uh, the short-term impact of uh, of of this virus. But so, you know, my sense is this crisis is bringing back the issue of modeling, and and you know, it could be uh, you know simulation type of models or macroeconometric models, or but, but we need as a profession to do better. In, in coming up with those tools that are readily available for economists to actually come up with those uh, assessments. So that's clearly one area that I can see, but, but the other one, obviously, is it's going to be, I would probably want researchers to really start looking at the productivity impact of these kind of shocks, right? We'll very, very quickly settle with the uh, commodities, you know, channel, we will the trade channel, value chains. But my sense is for African countries, I'm learning from the Ebola experience, there will be medium to long-term impact that go through the productivity channels, right? We could have a shock on human capital, you know, uh, flows. We can have even a shock on the stock of human capital if we start seeing a decline in uh, healthcare workers, you know, uh, those those uh, those 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 could actually translate into medium to long term decline in productivity, and that's certainly a big worry for me. I haven't seen studies done properly, you know, to really you know uh, document this, and that would be helpful. Very good. But, but I'm joined on this call with my colleagues uh, Cesar Calderon, Jim Cos. You know, if they, they they should feel free to add something, please. One thing I would add, building on what Albert mentioned, is of course there's a, a, a longer term question when we get through this crisis, which hopefully won't, won't be too long, is the recovery. And as part of the recovery, many of the uh, big questions that we've been thinking about in the Chief Economist Office and that researchers have been working on will remain to be very important questions. So one is vulnerability to external shocks. We're hearing about the impact that's having now, but looking ahead, researchers can think about how to take the lessons from this crisis. So one example that African governments are always very focused on is how to reduce resource dependence. Um, this is an area that's a perennial issue, but we're seeing the real effects of this now that African economies are so exposed to this kind of resource dependence. So when commodity prices fall, it has these big consequences. A related longer term research question is how to raise the investment rates and the quality of investment projects in Africa that can help the longer term debt sustainability challenges going forwards. The third area that I think is going to be very important and fruitful is around social protection and how to cushion um, Africa's poor from these kinds of external shocks in the future and what lessons we can take from the experience and the data that's going to be coming out of, of this crisis. And then finally is one around structural transformation and the structure of African economies. And the question that many people are going to be interested in asking is, as African economies recover from this big external shock, whether the structure of African economies can change and whether this can be an opportunity for 
a different kind of recovery, whether it can be a greener recovery, whether it can be one that has more emphasis on uh, digital technologies. We, we heard from Albert about the, the challenge of connectivity in some African economies. Um, and so whether this can be ultimately an opportunity for structural transformation in African economies in a different way, that quality jobs can be created in new sectors, including in the digital economy, going forwards. Uh, one thing that we can think about, given that Jim thought a little bit more on the longer term, I'm going to think a little bit about the shorter term, which has to do more with an, a point that Albert made, fiscal policy, which is going to be very important. Regardless of the fact that some countries, that the, the, the degree of fiscal space across countries in the region may be fair, we need to start thinking about fiscal policy for our countries. In what sense? Lately, if you have been on a blog or reading blogs or reading Twitter, you have seen a lot of uh, academics uh, that have been coming with a deluge of fiscal policy options. But the fiscal policy options that are being uh, discussed are more about uh, funding unemployment insurance or, for instance, uh, paid sick leaves. And although these, these uh, policies will help support aggregate demand by protecting those that are being laid off, uh, we have to think about fiscal policies in countries like our countries where there's a lot of informal aid. And also, if we want to have a targeted fiscal policy for countries that may have weak ID national systems. Thank you very much. And, and, and thank you for these, these ideas and these uh, actually kind of constructive things to keep academics that are listening to this busy as well in, in, in thinking and being, being useful. So uh, I would just simply want to end here by thanking you, Albert, Cesar and Jim for your contribution. And I would uh, wish you good luck in, in the common uncertain times, but also uh, let's hope we can all keep on touch in these kind of ways and, and look forward to more of these kind of uh, meetings over VC in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone.